It's a good day to be in the house of the Lord. Hi everyone, my name is Nicholas Gonzalez and I'm the associate pastor here at St. Andrew. And I'm so thankful that you're joining us for our contemporary word and song where you'll get a taste of our scripture reading from this past Sunday, as well as uh, the sermon, some prayers, some song and a blessing. Uh, I'm so thankful that you're tuning in online. And if you want to find out more about St. Andrew, head on over to our website, mystandrew.org, where you can find uh, out information about all the ministry that is happening here, both in person and online. Uh, and speaking of in person, if you're able to join us for an in-person worship service, we'd love to have you at any of our four services. We have traditional worship Sunday mornings at 8 and 9.30 and a contemporary worship service at 11 a.m. on Sunday morning, as well as our Monday night service, which is a blended service at 7 p.m. So join us across any of those services. We would love to have you. But if you can't join us in person, continue to join us online. With that being said, I pray a blessing on your worship today, and I hope to see you soon. Uh, and at this time, we'll continue with our reading of God's Word, which comes from uh, John's Gospel, the 18th chapter, and is read to us this morning by Joe Chevrolati. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priest handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, So you are a king? Jesus answered, You say that I am a king. For this I was born. And for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Good morning. Uh, at the Bethania Kids Benefit Dinner on Wednesday evening, uh, one of you uh, asked me about our recent trip to Italy and uh, whether uh, you were going to hear about it in upcoming sermons. Well, I think you know the answer to that question, uh, which for better or worse, I started thinking about in the context of this day, the annual celebration known as Christ the King, which falls every year, either right before or right after Thanksgiving. And when I did think about it, it occurred uh, to me that while Italy uh, is certainly a place of magnificent beauty and uh, fascinating history, if there's one more word that I would assign to the things that I experienced and saw there myself, that word would be power. In Venice, for example, uh, there is the Palace of the Doges, who were the aristocratic leaders of Venice for a thousand years. And in that palace, there is a, a room for uh, visiting ambassadors and other dignitaries. It is a waiting room, and it is so magnificent, so opulent, it is designed to be so impressive as to intimidate those visitors with the greatness of the people that they were about to see when they went into the next room and saw the leader sitting on his throne flanked by the members of the council. In Florence, uh, it was all about the Medici family. Uh, which was this political and uh, financial dynasty of unimaginable wealth and power and influence. They produced uh, no fewer than two queens and four popes for the Roman Catholic Church. And then in Rome, uh, well, there were images of many of those popes, bigger than life, scattered throughout the Vatican, images of the Roman emperors themselves scattered uh, throughout the city. And speaking of power, while I was in Italy, I also received this image from right here in Silver Spring. <laughs> My pleasure, brother. So power's everywhere, you know, it's uh, from Washington to Rome and every place in, in between. So. As you might recall, uh, the celebration of Christ the King is actually uh, one of our newer celebrations in the life of the church, uh, beginning as recently as the early 20th century, begun by a Roman Catholic Pope by the name of Pius XI, 
Who in the aftermath of World War I decided to send a message to the leaders of the world that the only King of Kings, the only Lord of Lords is Jesus the Christ. And over the years, that celebration has spilled over into also Lutheran churches and other denominations that also want to send that message and call attention to the sovereignty of Jesus in a world where an alarming num number of leaders want to gain power for themselves and build kingdoms for their own, filled with followers who blindly follow them. And yet, curiously, the scriptures that we typically read for the celebration of Christ the King may not suggest that kind of power. They include passages like Luke 23. During the crucifixion, when Jesus is dying, and the thief hanging next to him asks Jesus to remember him when he enters into his kingdom. This year, the passage comes, as you heard from John chapter 18, before the crucifixion, after the arrest of Jesus, when he climbs the steps of the praetorium or the judgment hall in the city of Jerusalem to be interrogated by Pontius Pilate, who was the Roman emperor's hand-picked governor of that occupied area at that time. And in that interrogation, as you also heard, Pilate asks Jesus the question, are you a king? Are you the king of the Jews? Well, Jesus, you know, kind of cleverly responds to the question with a question of his own and says to Pilate, uh, are you asking this uh, on your own or did others talk to you about me? And, and that's because if Pilate was asking the question on his own, it probably meant, you know, are, are you a political leader? Are you trying to, you know, incite an insurrection? Are you trying to overthrow the Roman government and its occupation? Because that would have been a very, very big deal to Pilate. But if he was asking on behalf of the religious leaders in Jerusalem, known as the Pharisees or the members of the Sanhedrin, that would not have been nearly as big a deal to Pilate because it wouldn't have affected the overthrow of his government. And so Jesus responds to his question with a question and then Pilate presses on that question so that Jesus ultimately says to him rather cryptically, my kingdom is not of this world. Because if it was, then my followers would be climbing the steps at the praetorium. They would be mounting an insurrection. They'd be fighting for my release. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Well, at that point, Pilate seems to come to the conclusion that this is obviously a religious matter. It's a spiritual issue. There's no military threat. An insurrection is not underway. People are not climbing the steps, uh, attacking the praetorium. And so he resists the crucifixion of Jesus. At least until he realizes that if he doesn't do it, then he's going to have a bigger problem with the crowd at the bottom of the steps than he has with the criminal at the top. And because Pilate's job at that point is to maintain the power and the control of the Roman Empire in Judah, but also to keep the peace among its people, he relents, he gives in, he orders the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And the rest, as we say, is history. Which leaves us with uh, just a couple of uh, questions that are important and relevant, not the least of which is, what's he talking about when he says, my kingdom is not of this world? And if it's not of this world, then what does it mean for me to, to live as a, as a loyal subject of Christ the King in this world? Well, the answers uh, to those questions are, you know, really all over the Gospels and, and elsewhere in the New Testament as well, like places where Jesus says to his disciples, that the kingdom of God is within you. It's not a physical place that you can point to and say, you know, well, there it is. And here it is. Because the kingdom of God, it's in your soul. It's in your heart. It's on your mind. And Jesus illustrates that even further, again, throughout the Gospels, when he says things like, the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed that grows into this big tree. 
Kingdom of God is like yeast that causes the bread to grow. Kingdom of God is like a good Samaritan who comes to the aid of a stranger. The, the kingdom of God is like the forgiving father of a prodigal son. In other words, the kingdom of God exists wherever the grace of God is operating, wherever it's active to change and renew and restore and transform your life. And so when Jesus bows down and he washes the feet of the disciples, that's the kingdom of God. When he wears a crown of thorns on the cross, that is the kingdom of God. It's wherever he reigns with mercy and grace. And the way this king gathers subjects for himself is not by coercing you or forcing you or intimidating you because he does it by serving you, by giving you everything that he ever had, by coming into this world and winning your love so that you will respond to the king of love by bowing down before him, by acknowledging him as your Lord, as the king of kings, and by trusting in his mighty and righteous judgments. Those of you who have taken uh, the Faith Walk course with me here at St. Andrew know that we always come to a point where we talk about, you know, what your picture of God is, how, how you imagine God, and how that differs from person to person and also uh, within denominational theologies and all the rest, and, and how some Christians see the sovereignty of God and of Christ at the core and the center and the heart of their image, their picture of God. God is sovereign. He's the king. He's the judge. He's the ruler. And, and how do you have a right relationship with the sovereign, with the king, with the judge? Well, you do it by obedience. You do it by being loyal subjects of the king, the sovereign, the judge. Now, I absolutely believe in the sovereignty of Jesus. I believe that he is the king of kings. I believe that he is the Lord of lords. But at the center of my picture of God, the way I imagine God, is not the sovereignty of God. It's the grace of God. It's the unconditional, undeserved love of God, who in my baptism made me a child of the kingdom, even though I'm going to blow it a thousand times in my relationship with God. And that's my picture because when the grace of God is at the center and the heart and the core of my picture of who God is, then I want to respond to the transforming love that fills my soul and, and transforms my whole life by believing in the sovereignty of God, by bowing down before him, by trusting in his mighty righteous judgment and acknowledging him as the Lord and the king of my life. And so the response is still the same. It's still obedience, but the relationship could not possibly be more different. And as you know, there are people all over this world who want us to follow them, to be their loyal subjects, and to obey them. But their call to obedience is a selfish obedience. You know, I want you to obey me because it's good for me. I want my children to obey me because it makes me look like a good parent. I want my congregation to obey me because it makes me look like an effective pastor or makes you look like a good teacher or a good leader and whatever it is that you do. It's a selfish kind of obedience. The kind of obedience to which Jesus calls us is selfless obedience. He wants to us to obey him because it's good for you, because it changes your life. It makes you look at things differently. It helps you to envision God and his presence in your life and your future with him in a whole different way. And while I'm at it, you know, if you want to be a really powerful person 
in your life, in your family, in your calling, or your vocation, if you want to be a person of influence, then you begin by remembering that you are a child of the king of love by grace. And by grace, you go out and you do the best you can to live your life as one of his loyal subjects by being a servant to others through your own giving, through your own generosity, through your own service. Because as a famous person once said, when the power of love overcomes the love of power, that's when the world will change. You know who said that? Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> the songwriter and guitarist said that, believe it or not, and it is true. So I was in Italy, uh, as you may know, uh, with my wife and our son David and 42 other uh, members and friends of uh, St. Andrew. Uh, but in those 11 days, uh, there was one part of one afternoon that I had all to myself. And so on that afternoon, uh, I walked uh, several blocks from our hotel in Rome to a place called the Sanctuary of the Sacred Steps, which are believed to be the very steps that Jesus climbed up to the Praetorium on that day in Jerusalem for his interrogation in front of Pontius Pilate. Those steps were relocated from Jerusalem to the city of Rome in the year 326 by Helena, who was the mother of Constantine the Great, who was herself a loyal subject of Jesus. Martin Luther climbed those steps when he visited Rome in 1510, having been told that it would redeem a soul from purgatory, which made it a very unsatisfying experience for him. People do it even now, to this very day. Some, I imagine, because they still think they have to. More, I hope, because they want to. They want to bow down before the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, who has done everything that you and I will ever need, that we could never do for ourselves, to create a right relationship with God by grace in time and for all eternity. And so it is true that the kingdom of Jesus is not of this world. However, it is stronger, it is more powerful, and it is more enduring than anything in this world that it could ever give or take away from you and me, because the kingdom of God is within you. It's in your soul. It's in your heart, where nobody can snatch it away from you, where no circumstance in life can ever destroy it, because by grace you have been made a child of the king forever. The Palace of the Doges is now a museum the Medici family line ended a long, long time ago. And the house of the Roman emperors is now in ruins. But the grace of God endures forever. And it still has tremendous, unspeakable power to transform your life, to help you to see everything in the good times, in the hard times, differently as you imagine God's grace at the heart and the soul and the center of everything. And so may you have the grace to be his loyal subjects in the world today so that the kingdom of God would be in your life and flow through your life for the comfort and the peace and the hope and the promise of a world that is looking for power and will never be fully satisfied by the kind it's looking for, but can know the limitless power of God's grace for the glory and the praise and the honor of Christ the King. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. Oh, here's my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the God is 
is holding on. Once more, so you remember. When the night is holding on to me, God is holding on. As we close, I'd love to lead you in the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And receive the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. On behalf of the Reverend Dr. Mark Rickle and myself, we are so thankful that you joined us today. And we invite you to continue in joining us in our weekly Sunday Word and Song. Blessings. Blessings.